Good morning and good afternoon. I hope we can be back in Sunday school soon. I hope you're all doing okay. I hope that this time will brighten your day. So let's talk about Jesus and all that he did. Stuck inside, ice inside, kids. Hi, kids. God is the best friend we could ever have. And because he is our best friend, we want to spend lots of time getting to know him better and better. We want to spend time with him and learn what he is like. Over the next couple weeks, we're going to learn about some things we can do to get to know God better. These things are called spiritual practices. When we practice these things, we learn how to spend time with God, how to talk to Him, how to listen to Him, and how to show His love to others. The first practice we're going to learn about is prayer. Prayer is talking and listening to God. Even though we can't see Him, God is with us all the time. The Holy Spirit lives in our hearts so we can talk to Him whenever we want. Maybe you have some questions about prayer. Like, when can we pray? The Bible says that we should never stop praying. That means we can pray all the time. In the morning, afternoon, and evening. We can pray whenever. We can pray first thing in the morning when we wake up. We can stop and pray in the little moments throughout our day, like when we're brushing our teeth. Even while we're playing or reading, we can talk to Jesus. Another question you might have is where can we pray? The Bible says the Holy Spirit lives in our hearts. That means he goes with us wherever we go. We can pray absolutely anywhere. We can pray when we're driving around in the car. We can talk to Jesus when we're playing outside and lying in the grass. Jesus hears our prayers even when we're upside down. But what can we pray about? God wants us to be his friends. Friends talk about lots of things. We can tell God what we're feeling. We can ask him for things we need. We can say sorry to him when we do something that makes him sad. We can talk to him about what we're playing with or what we're working on. God just wants to hear what's in our hearts and our minds. We can pray by ourselves or with a friend, in a large group, with our family, for a stranger, with anyone. We can pray loud or whispering or in our heads or singing or in another language. Another important part about prayer is listening. We shouldn't do all the talking. Sometimes we should just be quiet and listen to see if God wants to say something to us. He might give us a special thought in our head that comes from Him. Or show us something cool in creation that teaches us about Him. He might even remind us of a Bible verse or a Bible story. When we practice prayer to God, we get to know Him better and we become even closer friends with Him. So make sure to practice praying this week. Ask an adult to pray with you or pray by yourself throughout the week. Think about all the different ways and places you can pray. And remember, God loves you so much, no matter what. Thanks so much for listening. We love you and we hope you have a great week. Bye! Hi everyone! Today we're going to sing a song about prayer. Praying is very important. It's a special way to talk to God. Just like a telephone! Dear Jesus, it's Tally. This song has special actions. We did them sitting down.
So if you want, grab all the people around you to sit close together and do the actions. Hey, Oceanside Church family, Ray and Rebecca here. Welcome to our living room. We're going to sing a song called Again and Again. This is the original song that we introduced a few months ago. And it talks about God's faithfulness again and again, as the name says. Through all circumstances, this is a declaration of God's faithfulness and his goodness. So let's sing it.
morning, Oceanside Community Church. We are so glad that you've decided to join us online this Sunday. If you're new to us or just looking for more ways to connect, you can do so on our church Instagram and Facebook pages, on our website, www.oceansidecommunitychurch.ca, or on our church mobile app. We also actively post content to our YouTube channel, so please do check us out there too. We've been so encouraged by your faithful giving this past season and would like to encourage you to continue doing so as we prepare to regather. There are several ways you can give, either over our church app, via text, e-transfer, on our website, or by dropping by a giving envelope directly to the church. We are excited about our new message series starting in the next few weeks called Pandemic Perspectives. For a quick look at what topics will be covered in this new series, here's our trailer. Well, good morning, church. Uh, we're so excited to enter into what promises to be uh, an exciting six weeks in the life of our church. Not only are we beginning the series, uh, of which you just saw the video on pandemic perspectives, where we'll be covering topics such as uh, economics or money and uh, church life and home life and technology, Christian character, even gardening. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we will begin to slowly regather over the next few weeks. And it's no secret that we're in a uh, unprecedented, um, really unparalleled territory as Christians in the global church. And in a short time, the church has been forced to completely reinvent itself as we went into lockdown, rethink everything uh, in order to continue being the worshiping community that we're called to be, even in the midst of a pandemic. But although this particular situation is uh, unprecedented. Really, the idea that the church would suddenly have to shift everything it thought it knew about what it means to be the church, that situation is actually not unprecedented. See, in the early church, there was a similar paradigm-shifting moment in the church and how they went about it is actually all recorded in our text this morning from Acts 15 in the Bible and you can turn there now if you have a Bible with you but in case you're not familiar with the Bible or uh, this passage and the problem here's just kind of a quick summary the first followers of Christ were of course Jewish but as God's Spirit began to be poured out on the Gentiles, meaning non-Jews, and they came to faith in Christ, the question became, where do they fit in and how much of the Jewish law do they have to participate in to be a part of this community? And of particular concern was the uh, Jewish identity marker, or covenant marker of circumcision, an important custom. So you read here in chapter 15, verse 1, says, some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And then in verse 5, says that some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. So did Gentile believers in Jesus need to convert to Judaism and follow its laws and customs, particularly circumcision, to be included in the church. So all this might sound sort of uh, almost silly to us, or at least foreign to us, but that's partly because of what happens next and the decision that is made. For the first Jewish believers, it was a, a very legitimate question of, uh, can we be the church and include Gentiles who do not convert to Judaism. And this question results in what we call uh, the Jerusalem Council here in Acts 15. And what happens is a bunch of leaders in the early church get together. They discuss what the Spirit seems to be doing among the churches and among believers. They include the stories and testimonies of other believers, and they share their opinions. It says in verse 7 that they had much discussion. And they ultimately decide in verse 19 and 28 
that they should make it as easy as possible for the Gentiles to enter into the worshiping community. They should not burden them beyond what is necessary, although they do include some rules for them, sort of uh, compromises, so that the entire community can feel at ease, so that both sides have a, a mutual understanding, really, for what's expected. And the question sort of behind this situation in the early church was, how do we make the gospel and the gathered worshiping community as accessible as possible while still maintaining the essential makeup of who we are and what we do as the people of God? And they come to a conclusion and they write up a statement saying uh, they decided based on what seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, verse 28, and then they send a letter to the churches about their decision. And that has been my prayer as we come to this, you know, really complex issue about how to begin to regather as the church, the worshiping community, that we would come to a decision that seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, the church as a whole and its leadership. And to help us discern what the Spirit might be saying, we first ask you to take uh, a full week and really pray and listen to the Lord and, and then report back to us what you sense that the Lord was uh, saying or speaking to His church. And we got seven pages worth of material from 12 different people on just what they sense that uh, the Spirit was saying for our specific context as a church. And then in week two, we sent out a church congregational-wide survey, and 76 of you uh, responded to that, which is an extremely uh, high participation for a survey. So thank you for uh, participating in that and engaging and helping us in this discernment process. And our goal all along has been to somewhat follow this biblical pattern in Acts 15. That we recognize that like, like the early church, we're in a situation in which there is really no historical precedent for what to do. Wondering, how do we continue to be the church while recognizing the new situation unfolding around us? So as in Acts 15, we've, we've sought the Lord. We've sought to hear what he's saying to his people. We've had uh, much discussion, like in verse 7. And we've sought to make a decision like they did that made inclusion in the worshiping community as accessible as possible to different groups of people and the opinions represented. So we're going to now kind of lay out that plan. And I'm not saying uh, this whole task is easy. I'm not saying that we've just totally nailed it. And it's impossible to find a solution that will appeal to everyone and meet every need. As one person uh, compassionately said in their survey, quote, uh, you will get so many varying answers. I do not envy you uh, making this decision. So bless your heart, whoever said that. <laughs> so we've poured over uh, the prayer and survey results, and we've sought to put together, together a plan that honors where people are at, as well as what the Lord seems to be saying for this unprecedented new season in the church. So if we had to summarize uh, the results of the survey, it roughly divides into four groups or situations, each roughly representing about uh, a quarter or so of the congregation. So uh, group number one, about a quarter of the people um, are totally just ready to meet, have no concerns whatsoever. They're ready to go. Uh, as soon as we open the doors, they're going to be here. Uh, about another quarter of the people kind of deals with issues or concerns around kids, so uh, often represents families with kids and what to do about kids and how that will work. Uh, the third kind of quarter of people uh, want to meet, but do have quite a bit of concerns and uh, are, you know, unsure about how it's going to work for them. So um, maybe not sure just how it's going to go with proximity to others. And then the last quarter are at high risk to the virus or live with someone uh, at high risk or extra vulnerable or have a job that is high risk and they can't be around a lot of people. And so they uh, can't gather in person with others for the foreseeable future. So those are the four roughly equal segments that kind of emerged from this survey from our congregation with, you know, some overlap, of course, but, you know, ready to go, 
uh, unsure about where kids fit in, want to gather, but are cautious and then can't gather at all. And I think that's not only a picture of our congregation, but really just a picture probably of our community uh, as a whole, that even uh, you know, non-believers, those not yet in a Christian community, but we want to reach, um, would kind of fall into those groups too. And we want to keep our focus on, of course, reaching our community and new people. So what we set out to do is to consider how do we make the gospel and the worshiping community as accessible as possible to these four groups. So here's our plan. We're essentially going to have four services for these four different groups. So let me tell you all of them and then I'll walk through uh, each one and then I'll kind of give a, a big picture summary of how we'll approach this and some details. So the four worship services will be a family service at 9 a.m. in the multi-purpose room, an indoor service at 11 a.m in the main sanctuary, an outdoor service at 4 p.m. in the back parking lot, and then continuing with our online service at a time to be determined. So all of the services, of course, uh, except the online one, are limited to under 50 people uh, per the provincial guidelines. And the schedule will begin uh, in July, with, of course, the caveat that if things change or there's a sudden spike uh, in cases or local outbreak, we'll adjust. Uh, the outdoor service, however, will begin next Sunday. But we know from the survey that 80% of you say you're ready to regather at some point this summer, as long as there's no major spike in cases. Uh, another 8% are planning on returning, at least in the fall. So nearly 90% are interested in regathering sometime soon. And of course, at, at uh, the time of this message, uh, there's zero known cases here on the island. And we also have the full blessing of our provincial government, of Dr. Henry, as well as our local MLAs uh, from our area to gather in groups in less than 50 for worship. There's absolutely nothing uh, holding us back at this point. And so we do want to lean into uh, that freedom as much as possible in the safest way possible. So let me very quickly kind of give the vision behind each of these services. We're very excited about them, and then we'll give a lot more info in the coming weeks. But let's start with the family service, 9 a.m. in the multi-purpose room. This is mainly for families with children under 10 years old, although that's not a strict uh, guideline. So a concern from both people with kids as well as those uh, without kids is really what to do as a church about kids. So as one person said in their survey, Quote, I think our main challenge will be figuring out how to attend with children. And we understand that, and a lot of people have that sentiment. How do you tell little kids uh, to social distance? Uh, you, you sort of can't. And, you know, we don't want a situation where people are getting mad at kids or mad at parents or parents are feeling really anxious about what their kids are doing. I mean, that's just no fun, and you're not going to want to come uh, to a service uh, with that feeling. So we've created a family service for families with young kids with the, where the entire thing is geared toward kids and families and discipleship within the family union uh, within the family unit while also being around other families and and this service will be mostly led by the hazelmans so each family will sit at its own table with their own kids to kind of limit interaction. We'll have action songs and kids lessons and crafts and all of that kind of stuff. And there'll still be an abbreviated um, version of the message for that Sunday given by the speaker, which of course then parents can listen to the entire thing online at a later time, or maybe one of those parents can come uh, to the, the indoor service later. So Thomas and Ellie will give more vision behind this service uh, in their message that they give in two Two weeks. The next service is the indoor service at 11 a.m. in the main sanctuary. So this is for those who are more or less ready to gather, have few reservations. Uh, for families with children under 10, we're kind of recommending the family service, but um, of course anybody would be welcome in the service, babies uh, for sure, and if you can keep your kids with you, then kids as well. But you'll notice this service and the family service are in uh, two different rooms at 
two different times and they'll even have their own entrances. So this is to avoid kind of cross-contamination or uh, to decrease the risk as much as possible so that nobody has been in the room uh, before your group when you use it. The 9 a.m. won't be in the multi-purpose room, the 11 a.m. Uh, won't be won't use the sanctuary. Uh, I think it's the other way around. <laughs> just said. The 9 a.m. won't be in the sanctuary. The 11 a.m. Uh, won't be in the multi-purpose room. Uh, all the services will be about 45 minutes, so they are scaled back, and that's kind of uh, the recommended time by the province for gatherings, uh, so that there's plenty of time in between to clear the building, kind of clean and reset, and any common areas like washrooms and high-touch areas will be cleaned between the services. The third service is the outdoor service at 4 p.m. in the back parking lot of the church. So this is an all ages service, but uh, particularly has in mind those who maybe need some extra precautions or extra space with distancing and interaction because you'll be outside and can get really as much distance as you feel you need. And this may not be ideal for young kids if you can't kind of keep them with you because there is no, uh, you know, no fences or anything like that in the back parking lot. But the service will be right roughly the same as the indoor service, but of course will take on its own feel and vibe and will have some modifications for sure. And of course it's weather permitting every week. But an advantage of the outdoor service is you can likely uh, sing, if you have quite a bit of distance between you and the other person, sing uh, without a mask, um, which is a great advantage. For the indoor service, um, because of the research about singing, we'll likely say if you want to sing out loud, uh, you will have to wear a mask. Uh, otherwise, masks will be optional during all the services. And, you know, of course, you can still pray and dance and clap and kind of commune with the Lord in your own ways um, during kind of the music part of the service or while others are singing uh, because perhaps, you know, wearing a mask while singing is just not your jam. And uh, that's okay. We understand that. Commune with the Lord in, in other ways. And I know that's probably tough to hear. And I mean, I personally uh, hate it, the idea of wearing a mask while I'm singing. But as you might know, I mean, Alberta has banned singing together because of the research on increased spread uh, from singing. And, you know, we're glad our province has not done that. It does seem a little bit uh, heavy handed. And some of the churches are pushing back in Alberta. But we do want to keep people safe even while worshiping the Lord. Uh, and we know, I mean, just to give you some insight into the difficulty that, you know, we're wrestling with, uh, some people said in the survey that they wouldn't attend if they were required to wear a mask. But then also some people said in the survey that they wouldn't attend if they weren't <laughs> required to wear a mask and everybody else around them. So for now, we're hoping the outdoor service works for those who uh, have a few more reservations and want a more protective kind of space. And then lastly, there's the online service at a time uh, to be determined. It depends uh, if we're able to try to live stream the 11 a.m. service, which is our goal. Uh, but otherwise, we'll, we'll have some pre-recorded or recorded material for that. And this is for all the other situations. So those who are unable to make it because they have to stay kind of in isolation or quarantine due to the people that they're living with or themselves. Um, this could be if you're away or just if all the spots were to fill up in the other services, then at least you'd still have the online option or if the outdoor service gets canceled. And our goal will be to make it uh, either a recording or live stream of the indoor services possible because we understand that now that people actually are here in the building gathering together, you're going to want to feel a part of that as much as possible. Up until this point, we've kind of thought that live streaming or recording in the sanctuary really seems kind of awkward and pointless because you know nobody's there. And uh, But now people actually will be there and we want you to feel like you can participate as much as possible and be there uh, and experience it online. As far as midweek gatherings outside of Sundays, uh, most of our life groups are taking a summer break, but we would like to see several uh, midweek worship hubs at various outdoor locations, whether in people's backyards or safely in a public space with appropriate distance where there's just some singing, prayer, fellowship, no real uh, agenda or format. So if you're interested in hosting one of these in a space, please let us know and we'll help get the word out. Uh, but these are sort of up to the congregation in a way to put together. 
So I realize there are likely so many questions and uh, there's so much for us to communicate about protocols and safety and, and our procedure. And, and that's why we're not starting the two morning services uh, until July 5th, because we want time to communicate all that to you so you know exactly what to expect, uh, so you can feel safe and confident. And we're putting all of that uh, together. And there will of course be pre-registration required um, for all the services so that we don't exceed uh, 49 people in the building and we'll make that all available to you very soon. But we're gonna start with this plan and then you know we'll adjust and adapt uh, as needed as we see how it goes. So before we close, let me just address a few important questions or concerns. Number one, doesn't this approach run counter to the intergenerational makeup that makes our church so special. Yes, <laughs> this is a huge downside. We considered so many ideas and options, but just couldn't figure out one that includes, you know, kids only classes or kids in the main sanctuary that also allowed us to practice the proper protocols and that didn't put major stress upon parents or kids or those around them. But remember that this is temporary. For a season, yes, we can't be quite as intergenerational. However, our approach is to then embrace uh, this as an opportunity and kind of see the benefits in it. So for example, this is a unique opportunity to really focus on discipleship together as a family. And I know the Hazelmans are excited about that. Second question, will church be the same? Uh, won't it be awkward? No, it will not be the same. Uh, yes, it will be a little bit awkward. Uh, our Pentecost drive through party was uh, really a bit of a good indication that there, there were some awkward moments uh, in that. It's kind of like, do I get out of my car? Uh, do I go enter into that conversation? Should I make the rounds and say hi to everybody? How close should I be getting to people? What do I do? And, you know, there was sort of some unknown and, and awkwardness about it. I even personally just kind of didn't know how to behave or act. Uh, but at the end of the day, I felt so encouraged just at the sight of other people. Even if I couldn't act with them, interact with them the way I wanted to or the way we normally would have if there were no restrictions. So the benefits of being together with restrictions far outweigh the downsides, the awkwardness, or being by ourselves in our living rooms. As one person said in the survey, quote, it will feel very strange but it is better than not seeing anyone. And I say, you know, amen uh, to that. Oh, recently, uh, my gym, our community classes at the gym uh, reopened, and it's a great example or kind of parallel here that, uh, you know, is it the same that it used to be? Uh, absolutely not. Classes are limited to, you know, six of the same people, and, and we stay in cohorts so we don't kind of mix uh, the classes, and it's awkward to maneuver around the gym while keeping our distance, and everything takes longer, and cleaning all of our equipment at the end takes forever, and, you know, there are things we're no longer allowed to do, right? We, we can't high five. Uh, we're not allowed to use the, the communal chalk bucket for, for grip. We can't use the, the climbing ropes because of, you know, touching them. We can't help or spot each other uh, as we're working out. There are some workouts and movements we can't even do because of distancing requirements. But you know what? I'm just happy to be back. And I'd rather have a scaled back version of what I'm used to than nothing at all, because I know that this is good for me. It's good for my physical and, and, and mental health. And it's the same with gathering for church. We can't shake hands, give hugs, have prayer in close proximity, have coffee in the lobby, do communion the same way, have kids classes or whatever, but you know what? I'd rather have a scaled back or less than ideal gathering for worship than no gathering at all. Because I don't know about you, but the last few months has been pretty painful, pretty tough not to be with everybody. And so I'm just happy to be back because gathering is just so essential to our spiritual health. Third concern or question might be, uh, will this burn out our leaders? Is this sustainable? Uh, I know it's an ambitious plan, and I hope you feel our hearts as leadership in all of this. 
You know, of course it would be easier to run three to four identical services all the same, but it means that we would potentially only reach 25% of the potential people out there and, and could leave out kids or those not ready to be in proximity in an indoor space. Uh, and we don't wanna choose just the more convenient option. Uh, but we're not gonna require all of our pastors or musicians to be at all the services. Uh, and our music teams will likely usually only be two people, partly because we don't wanna take up 25% of the allowed amount of people in a service just with pastors and musicians, which it would easily be if all the pastors and musicians and their families came. Uh, but we'll try to rotate around and get to all of the, the services so that we can worship with various groups and, and see each other. Last question might be, well, can I bring friends? Uh, will we make room for visitors? And you know, absolutely, you can and should still invite friends and neighbors and family members. I mean, the Great Commission still applies during this time, but you will need to sign them up. But you know, in a way, what a great way to get a commitment uh, ahead of time uh, that you have to sign them up and kind of commit to it. And we'll leave about five spots or so open in each service, just so that in case anybody did see our service times and happened to show up or there's a last minute decision, we'll be able to accommodate some of those people and hopefully not have to turn anybody away and if we're consistently running out of space that would be awesome and we will absolutely add services uh, if we need to I mean if people want to worship together we will make room I mean, how amazing would it be if, if the church grew during this time and that what we added to our number daily and weekly even during uh, this season so we want to close by just praying over all of this, praying uh, together. But first, before we do that, let's just sing a song, um, probably without our masks on at this point, uh, just declaring that we know that God is for us. I mean, I've been so amazed as he's brought this together. And, and just this morning, driving over here thinking, Lord, I, we, I never could have done this come up with this plan ourselves, right? That this just seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And, and it was just uh, so encouraging for me. So let's pray over that in just a second, but let's sing this song, reminding ourselves, God is for us. He is for our church. He is for our community. He is for this city and he wants to reach them. And we're gonna ask him to multiply our efforts in just a second. But first let's sing this song. Let's close with the song, God is for us. It's a song that we learned earlier this year and it's a great declaration of how God is for us and with us and going before us to prepare a way in all things and all circumstances. And that even as we face this new phase as a church and the new phase as a province, we can trust in him and uh, keep our faith in him. Let's declare it together. We won't fear the battle, we won't fear the night, we will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us, you will lead the way, we have found a refuge only you can save. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love gives a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Even when I stumble, even when I fall, even when I turn back, still your love is sure. You will not abandon, you will not forsake. You will cheer me onward with never-ending grace. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Neither height nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds me in his 
love Neither height nor depth can separate us Hell and death will not defeat us He who gave the Son to free us Holds me in His love Now our God is for us The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress Raise your voice now No love is greater Who can stand against us if our God is for us Amen So I want to close together, all of us, seeking the Lord uh, in prayer. When we were gathered earlier this week as a team and we were praying and doing our, our much discussion on Tuesday, I was so struck by Ellie's prayer uh, that she prayed for the Lord to miraculously meet the needs of everyone. And it struck my spirit because I had already been thinking about the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and the five loaves and the, the two fish in relation to all of this. And, and, you know, just in thinking of this, this new reality for the church and reading over the survey results, I kind of felt like Andrew in John chapter 6 where he says, you know, how can this, five loaves, two fish, how can this meet the needs of so many? And I sort of, you know, feel like that. Lord, how can this feeble plan meet the needs of so many in our community, so many lost who need to hear the gospel and we're, we're limited to under 50 people, shorter services, we can't sing the way we used to, fellowship the way we used to. Lord, how can we do this? But the Lord takes the loaves and the fish, all the disciples could manage and all we can manage for now. And he multiplies that effort and miraculously meets the needs of everyone who is there. So let's pray for the Lord to multiply the impact of these services, to miraculously meet the needs of our community, the Oceanside area, even in our limited capacity. So Lord, we pray for that. Would you miraculously meet the needs, not only of our church community, but our community at large. We bring before you our, our five loaves and our two fish, uh, our, our services, the requirements, the restrictions, all of that. You get it. You understand it but Lord we know that your heart loves your church and you love the lost people and so we're praying that you would multiply these efforts Lord we have uh, sought with all our hearts I think I can say to to seek you to follow you to hear your voice and what this next step is for our church and whether this is for a season or for a long time uh, Lord you know but we want to follow you faithfully and continue to hear your voice so Lord I pray for supernatural unity unity among our church family, despite all the different opinions, all the different places people are at, Lord, that we pray for supernatural unity among us, that we would be kind and compassionate and understanding for one another. I pray for a sense of joy and, and uh, expectation, even as we gather and even as it feels different and looks different that there would be a spirit of celebration, that your spirit uh, would, would just lift our hearts, God. And we continue to pray that we would continue to reach lost people during this time, that we would not take our focus off of the Great Commission, for you are not restricted in any way, and your spirit is not restricted. Your spirit knows no boundaries and no restrictions. So we say, come, Lord Jesus, and help us and aid us as we move forward in the coming weeks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have an awesome week. Be, please be praying uh, over this plan. We will see some of you at the outdoor service next week. And all the rest of you, we will see you online as normal. And can't wait for uh, July when we can see many more of you. Have an amazing week.